I've been with the CFIA since 2017. Um, I graduated from OVC in 2010. I've been in both mixed practice and small animal practice. Um, I myself have a hobby farm. I do have a small flock of sheep myself as well. So these regulations completely apply to me as well as applying to you guys as well. And I'm really looking forward to talking to you this evening. Um, so this presentation uh, I got from a colleague from out west. It's a very good presentation. So uh, compliments to the presentation go to Sarah Johansson, who's the person that put it together, and we're just stealing and using it for tonight. Um, please don't hesitate to put any questions like uh, was said in the chat box during the presentation if you have any. So without further ado, I will get started. So an overview, CFIA's role in animal welfare. So this presentation is intended to focus on the sheep and goat uh, producers today. We recognize that there's a difference between these species. However, in terms of transport, there are similarities in how they're handled from the perspective of part 12 of the animal health regulations. Um, I will highlight important points mainly focused on the sheep producers and don't worry, there will be time for questions. And also, I'm just going to stop my video because I keep having a little message popping up that says my internet connection isn't very good. So I'm just going to pop off here. No problem. All right, so CFIA's role in animal welfare. CFIA is responsible for humane transportation of live animals coming into, moving within, and leaving Canada. So treating the animals in our care properly is an obligation, not an option. And these are the regulatory requirements of the Health of Animals Regulations Part 12. Enabling, the Enabling Act is the Health of Animals Act. So CFIA has the authority to conduct an animal transport inspection at any location where animals are or may be transported. CFIA's approach to inspections is risk-based. CFIA inspectors also do routine inspections to verify compliance within the requirements of legislation at ports of entry in Canada, so borders, ports, and airports, federal and provincial registered slaughter establishments, assembly centers, which would be your auction markets, sale yards, or other animal areas where animals are gathered. We can do randomized roadside inspections and we can do unannounced inspections, for instance, when there's a complaint or a problem. And we do do inspections on roadside emergencies such as truck rollovers and accidents. CFIA is also responsible for the welfare of animals during slaughter at federal establishments, which is also covered under the Safe Food for Canadians regulation. In general, the, the animal welfare is in Canada is federal, provincial, and territorial governments. So I've given you an overview of kind of what we do. Um, anything that we don't cover is covered by the provincial and territorial governments. So the history and the research. So the reason for the regulatory changes. So a lot have changed in humane transport since those regulations were originally introduced in 1977. Um, the social expectations for humane treatment of animals has risen considerably, and the amendments of the HT regs reflect the current ongoing research. Um, there's been many advances in production practices and transport technology, and more science-based evidence that highlights the impact of long transport times on the health and welfare of livestock. The amendment to the HT regulations reflect current ongoing research, consumer demands, international changes, and industry practice. So they did do a regulatory impact analysis statement and they looked at backgrounds, clarifications, issues, regulatory and non-regulatory options were considered. There was a cost benefit analysis done, domestic and international coordination and cooperation. And we did a bunch of consultation. And there's a list of scientific publications that CFIA reviewed during the development of these amendments. <laughs> Come on, computer, you can do it. Uh, I don't know what it's doing. Hold on here. No problem. There we go. Perfect. It's working now. Okay, good. My connection just went blah. All right, so implementation. 
So the amendment part 12 of the HAR was published on February 20th, 2019 and came into force on February 20th, 2020. Um, we recognize that some change was needed in culture, infrastructure and practices and that that change is hard. So they started out with a compliance period um, from February 2020 to February 2022, um, which is coming into the ending now on the 20th, where we did awareness, education and then a graduated enforcement. It's important to note that the compliance promotion period was basically for the prescriptive food, water and rest max intervals only. Um, so everything else had come into, um, had been uh, put into force as of 2020. It's only the food, water, rest that are coming to an end now in 2022. And the outcome provisions for food, water and rest are currently enforceable as well until the 2020 or 2022, February 20th, 2022. Sorry. <laughs> so we did a lot of work with stakeholders and events such as this webinar to ensure that there's a clear understanding and a traditional guidance. And I was really happy that sheep farmers reached out to us in order to uh, help clarify matters and go over everything with you guys again. So that was great. So how do hours and transportation time limits carry across the US border? So part 12 applies to the transportation of animals of all species entering or leaving Canada or within Canada. <clears throat> so we often get the question of how does this apply once the animals cross the border? So once exported <clears throat> animals leave Canada, <clears throat> excuse me guys, once exported animals leave Canada, the importing country has oversight over their own animal welfare legislation. So basically what happens is once they leave, it's up to those different countries to take over the animal welfare. What we can do though is for animals that are going on long journeys, we're allowed to look at itineraries and schedules, we may request those to make sure that the regulations are being met while the animals are in Canada. And these regulations apply to all transported animals. So that's farm animals, pets, zoo animals, etc. So I am a producer, not a transporter. Does part 12 of the HAR apply? Apply to me? So this is a recurring question that we receive and the answer is yes they do, especially in the selection of the right animals to ship and communication is key information with transporters. So this applies to all those involved directly or indirectly in the transport of live animals. So producers need to make the transport decisions on the farm and not extend that responsibility down the value chain. So part 12 of the HAR applies to all of those directly or indirectly transported of live animals, including those who plan the transport, prepare the animals for the journey, assemble the animals, catch the animals, load the animals, confine the animals in the crate container or conveyance, move the animals from the point of origin to their destination and unload those animals. So anyone that is responsible for any of those, those regulations apply to you. So a new HT mindset, predict, plan, prevent. So transportation of live animals is a complex process, just like with food safety programs, checklists, plans, records, evaluation of outcomes. So with the amended regulations, we're trying to establish a new culture or mindset, <clears throat> which involves predict, plan and prevent. We also know that transport is a stressful event for animals and it's up to those of us involved in the process to ensure their welfare is a priority. The HT regulatory amendment is focused on positive welfare outcome through establishing clear effective procedures and record keeping. The goal is to prevent problems whenever possible by identifying where things can go wrong and by taking measures to prevent those situations from happening. When things do go wrong, to look at why and go back to the program and modify it so it doesn't happen again which also leads into contingency planning. So the code of practice of care for the handling of goats and the code for sheep also show that farmers demonstrate responsible stewardship for their animals and the environment sustainability, producing high quality, safe and nutritious food for consumers. Outcome based and versus prescriptive provisions. So obviously these are silly pictures and they're not from Canada, but they give you guys an idea. So the new regulations are more focused on outcome. So a performance approach, which has be what has to be achieved versus exactly how to achieve it. So it gives the producers a lot more flexibility to you who know your animals 
there are still some very clear provisions on what need to be done. Um, but like a HACCP or a farm food safety program, sometimes the requirements tell you how the picture must look in the end, and sometimes it tells you exactly and precisely what elements you need to include, and sometimes it's both. Another example would be within the handling provisions, where the outcome is that a person who is loading or unloading an animal from a conveyance or container must use a fixed or movable ramp apparatus where the animal is not likely to suffer, be injured, or die. The prescriptive element in this provision is that the ramps used for sheep and goats must not exceed 35 degrees. That's a new requirement from the old regs, which was a 45 degree species for all, 45 degrees for all species. Your ramp has to be built and used to prevent animals from suffering injury or death. It also has to be no more than 35 degrees for sheep or goats, but other than that, it's basically up to you guys. So on the slide here, <clears throat> it just gives you an uh, idea of outcome-based versus prescriptive. So the regulations look long and difficult upon first glance, and they're a little bit daunting to read. So think of them more as having eight key areas, which include transport on planes, boats, and fully equipped vehicles. However, the focus today is around transport commonly seen in Canada. So really six areas. So preventive measures, so knowledge assessment, monitoring, contingency planning, vulnerable animals, which includes compromised cull, lactating, and very young animals, how animals must be handled, protecting animals from weather, noxious gases, and road conditions, record keeping and documentation, and food, water, and rest. All right, we'll get started and move into the preventive measures of the regulations. So part 12 of the HAR, what has changed, the short version. So the amendment brings a culture change focused on prevention and accountability. So very similar to food safety and on-farm food safety and welfare programs like the ProAction in Dairy. So the intent of the, the HAR amendments is to build on the culture of continuous improvement in animal handling that underpins Canadian animal agriculture. Canada has a growing body of knowledge, industry-driven recommended practices, scientific data, animal care assessment and training programs, as well as a strong commitment to animal welfare, including during transportation. So contingency planning. In an emergency, what do we do? And what have we practiced? Like fire drills. The benefit to you as producers, consumers of your product want to know, want you to do the right thing, obviously, but also to be able to prove that you're doing the right thing. So if you have a plan and you're able to follow your plan, this shows that you guys are, are on the right track. Am I a commercial carrier? This is another question that we commonly get asked. So this is one of several new definitions in part 12 of the HAR. So commercial carriers are those who operate a, a transport business or who are in the business of transporting animals for compensation. There are some requirements specific to commercial carriers, such as having to provide training to employees and agents and having contingency plan and records. It's important to make this distinction as commercial carriers are the only ones required to ensure their employees or agents are trained, whereas both commercial carriers and those transporting for financial benefit, which is say what your regular producer is if you're transporting your own sheep to market, um, for financial benefit have to do contingency plans and records. So the commercial carriers have to do the training, whereas everyone has to have contingency plans and records. So an example of a commercial carrier, so a carrier who owns vehicles that are hired to transport animals or owner operators who contract an agent to transport animals, large vertically integrated companies with a transport division, the commercial carrier category of transporter is required to have training, knowledge, and skills, a contingency plan, and records. So examples of persons not considered commercial carriers but are transporting animals for financial benefit. A producer transporting their own animals to an assembly center, a feedlot that transports its own animals to slaughter. So that category of transporter is not required to have training but are required to have knowledge and skills necessary to load, unload, and transport sheep and contingency plan and records. So examples of persons not considered commercial carriers or transporting for financial benefit is a producer transporting their animals, say, to a 4-H uh, competition, a neighbor or friend who occasionally transport your animals in exchange for baked goods, or a producer moving sheep from pasture to a lambing barn. That category of transporters required to have knowledge and skills, but you don't need all of the paperwork. So hopefully that helps clear up a little bit. 
Knowledge and skills. So training requirements is key for stakeholders. Knowledge and skills is an outcome-based requirement. There is no required course. We often get that question a lot as well. The regulations require that all regulated parties must know what to do and have the necessary knowledge and skills to meet the outcomes required by the regulation. Only commercial carriers are required to be trained, but the type of training is not specified, only the subjects that need to be covered. These resources, along with the regulations, illustrate that we learn by doing, which is also the case when you live it. Farm families, uh, for example, such as this one. Educational resources to help producers and transporters are available. One of the advantages to producers is that the regulations are in line with the NAFAC code and other animal welfare assurance programs. So the knowledge and resources and programs you are already using line up with what we're asking you to do. Producers, transporters, auction markets, and abattoirs are all in a position to make appropriate transportation decisions. Resources suggested include videos, pictures, decision trees, information cards, posters, and mobile-friendly website or application. Knowledge and skills is an outcome-based requirement. Sources for training, it can be commercial training, industry-specific design for their specific needs, codes of practice, etc. These are all written by industry for industry. The Code of Development Committee and the Scientific Committee work together to develop a science consensus-based code. The result is a code that is scientifically informed, practical, and re reflects societal expectations for responsible farm animal welfare. Part 12 of the HAR is written similarly and was consulted and went through a public comment period where concerns and issues were addressed. So these are a good tool to refer to and the NAFAC Transportation Codes of Practice is currently being updated and there should be a new publication coming out in 2023. So commercial carrier training for employees. If you are in the business of transporting animals and you have employees or agents, you must ensure they receive training. All other transporters are not required to have training, only the knowledge and skills. Taking available training would be one way of acquiring it, but it can also be done through mentorship, um, living, however you guys will pick that up. Transporters face numerous barriers to recruitment, training to be a hauler, workers with livestock hauling experience are difficult to employ. So how to assess that training requirement is fulfilled if when a certificate is not required by the regulations. So what we're looking for is someone demonstrating good stockmanship, evidence that actions have been taken are in line with best practices and the records of training that you have been given. Assessing animals before transport. So who must assess? So both the producer and the transporter are both required to have an important role. So it's critical because in some cases we know the journey can be quite long, um, such as with transporting cull ewes from the west to the east, which is often a multi-phase journey to their final destination as they go from farm to auction, then to an assembly yard, then to another auction, and then finally to slaughter. If they're being loaded, they need to be able to endure all aspects of the journey and arrive in good condition. So the transport continuum is inclusive of all stages of transportation and can be equally or in some cases more important to consider than the journey duration. In a perfect world, we would only ship animals that are in great shape for a short distance. However, we all know the uh, realities of our situations. Transportation is stressful and the truck ride, the noise, the strange environment when animals are entering livestock auction or abattoir is affected by a complex interaction of factors, including but not limited to loading density, transportation duration, ventilation, trailer design, weather condition. Um, weak animals are less able to cope and the welfare of animals being transported is always paramount. So the greatest problems occur when we transport unsuitable animals. Some of the risks to consider include pre-existing conditions like hernias, lamenesses, prolapses, space requirements, so overcrowding and the ability for them to travel in a natural position, compatibility, so transporting use with rams, um, duration of transport, temperature, weather, conditions, um, think of animals, those recently sheared or crutched, delays, snowstorms, hot weather, border crossing accidents, types of conveyances, equipment, gates, ramps, edges, all of these can add to the animal's stress. So this helps with contingency planning. So one of our new requirements is for contingency planning. 
Um, so which is pre-planned procedures that can be used in the event of unforeseen transport situations like an accident, inclement weather, or traffic delays. So these should include instructions about what to do if the animal becomes compromised or unfit while en route, and contingency plans should also be realistic, practical, and focused on the prevention of animals suffering. Many of you are likely doing this already, you just haven't formalized it or you call it something else. So predictable possible transport Predictable possible transport events like delays, planned destination changes, equipment breakdowns, accidents, rollovers. What if someone asks you to load something that you think is not fit? Where's your next food, water, and rest stop? Are you able to euthanize an animal en route if there's a problem? So the goal is to prevent problems from happening whenever possible by identifying where things can go wrong and by taking measures to prevent those situations from happening. Talk about not being able to foresee everything, even with good planning, um, but this is what an inspector will consider. So things to consider would be if a journey is longer than expected or if loading is delayed. How are you gonna keep the animals comfortable and ventilated? Is there a planned route to keep the truck moving if needed? Are there shady areas where you can park? Is there access to water for sprinkling the animals to keep them cool? Or for instance, if there's an accident or a rollover involving the animals, who do you call? How do you handle unload reload? How do you transfer animals from one conveyance to another safely? Is there a plan to get the truck and trailer upright and reloaded as soon as possible? The contingency plan does not need to be in writing, um, but it's recommended because it's easier for us to go over it and see if I can ask for it. Sorry, guys, my computer's just taking a while. There we go. No problem. <laughs> so how will your, will your plan be assessed by CFIA? So compliance will be evaluated by whether the plan was available and whether it was implemented or not on its format. So to ensure contingency plans are successful, it is important that everyone understands the goal, um, that you know how to uh, accurately assess your situation and decide what steps need to be executed. Plans need to be practical and realistic, and there needs to be clear communication. Also, plan on reviewing and updating your plans on a regular basis. So there are different numbers that you can call. I think these are Alberta, Alberta based ones since this is where I stole the, uh, the presentation from. But uh, Tom, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but there are a number of numbers in Ontario as well. And I don't know if the Ontario sheep farmers, if you guys have a, have a number you guys can call or if you guys have a, a plan and evident of one of your members having problems. Yeah, and we do have some of those resources on the um, on the uh, website, which I'll provide later in the uh, chat box. Oh, that's perfect. So monitoring en route. So live animal transport is dynamic. So you as producers need to let uh, them know if there are animals at risk. So when you're loading animals, if you have any animals you're not sure about or animals that you need the transporters to keep an eye on, um, that they need to check more frequently. So an example is maybe an animal with a small hernia that at the start of transport might be getting worse over time because of sorting, loading, bumping, jostling. Um, so it has a pre-existing condition that may be impacted by transport. So it may need more space. It may need to be with uh, less animals. It may need special handling. Um, so it's just everything that the transporter should know. They should be stopping and checking. You should be monitoring your animals while they're being transported. Um, because of these increased risk factors, um, the animal needs to be monitored more frequently than, say, a sound animal would be. Which brings us to vulnerable animals and how those provisions have changed. So vulnerable animals. So some animals are better able to withstand transport than others. Again, in a perfect world, we would only load and transport fit animals for short differences. And in a perfect world, compromised animals never end up in an assembly yard. <laughs> so these would include compromised and unfit animals, um, lambs, kids, eight days of age or less, and those too young to be fed exclusively on hay or grain, any cull animals, um, in particular, those cull sheep being transported from west to east and lactating animals. 
unfit and compromised animals. So there are special provisions now for more vulnerable animals, compromised and unfit for transport is now defined by law and it replaces the compromised animal policy, which was the cat policy that you may be familiar with. Much of it has now been integrated into the regulations and is now law. Unfit animals must not be transported except to receive veterinary care on the advice of a veterinarian. Alternate options for cull animals that are unfit for transport may have to be considered, including on-farm slaughter or euthanasia. Compromised animals cannot be legally loaded to be shipped to an assembly center, so that's an auction yard market or anything like that, and that's defined in the regulations. Compromised animals can no longer alive, arrive at slaughter facilities without having been isolated for transport. So you can't no longer just send a whole bunch of uh, lame sheep, say, in together. Um, the compromised animals all need to be loaded in certain ways to make sure that they are able to make the transportation well. Animals that underwent uh, routine livestock surgeries, such as dehorning, debutting, castration, um, are to be considered compromised and can be transported only under certain conditions. Culling and transportation decisions are part of farming. However, there are challenges with making these decisions and we do realize that. Producers need to decide whether to treat an animal and wait for the meat and milk withdrawal times to be completed before making transport. Um, decisions such as sending the animal to the local abattoir, culling it uh, to a livestock auction or euthanizing it on farm due to health and welfare reasons. One of the biggest challenges is timing. So when do you remove the animal from the herd? The animals removed when the economic value fall, falls below the goals of the herd. However, poor production and reproduction may be the result of an underlying disease, making timely culling decisions best for the welfare of the animal. So if basically waiting too long can result in an animal being unfit for transport or one that's condemned at slaughter. Weak or sick animals should not be loaded and transported to livestock sales or to a collection yard if they are fit for transport under provincial and federal transport regulations and fit for human consumptions, they should be sold directly to a slaughter plant. Animal welfare is not black and white. In fact, it's pretty gray and gray is not always an easy call and we do realize that. What is a small recto prolapse? For instance, if it goes back in when the animal can get up, what if my animal has a limp but appears fine otherwise? Other considerations is that some conditions will become worse in the winter, for example. Compromised lame does not, what is a compromised lame animal? So it does not have halted movement or reluctance to walk and can walk on all its legs as opposed to an unfit animal that's lame which has halted movement or reluctance to walk or cannot walk on all of those legs and we do know how fast one can move to the other. So special handling for compromised animals. Uh, for instance, example, consider it the rock star treatment. So animals that are compromised should be separated from other animals. They should be loaded individually in a rear compartment. Measures should be taken to prevent the animal's suffering, such as extra bedding, pain medication, frequent access to feed and water, local and direct transport only, basically from the farm to slaughter and not to an assembly yard or an auction. Food water rest period is a max of 12 hours, so they can't be transported for more than 12 hours. Other measures such as appropriate, uh, like veterinary assessment prior to loading, if unsure of the animal's capacity to withstand transport. So stakeholders must be aware that even a mild lameness can deteriorate very rapidly due to handling, loading, and unloading activities, especially when ramps are required. A lame animal is also at a disadvantage because it cannot bear weight evenly on all four feet to maintain its balance in a moving conveyance and is therefore more likely to fall, be trampled, or suffer unduly from trailer vibrations or every time it is forced to place more weight on the affected limb to compensate for unexpected movement or a rough road surface. So this can quickly cause the animal to become unfit, which is one of the reasons why it's so important to monitor them during transport. So we do have several infographics pictographs that are easily accessed on our website and you can print them out. Uh, this one, for example, is for assessing animals prior to transport for the capacity of fitness um, for them to withstand the transport process. So it's not easily to eat, it's not always easy to tell when in doubt, ask your vet. Uh, there are tools to help if in doubt, don't transport, treat or call on farm. 
only suitable animals are fit for standard transport when you run into trouble when basically when we transport unsuitable animals. So special provisions for compromised animals. So we touched a few slides back when we talked about the rock star treatment for compromised animals. And here are the special provisions that need to be taken. So we don't want them to have to climb ramps in a truck. We basically want private seating. So they need to be isolated and they need to be on a direct flight to slaughter no more than 12 hours without food or rest. For example, in the picture, this doe would be in peak lactation and provided her kid is over 48 hours old, they could be transported together, but only for a maximum of 12 hours before being provided food, water and rest again. If she's to be transported, actions need to be taken to relieve engorgement <coughs> by transporting, <coughs> excuse me, by transporting the animals with their suckling offspring if the offspring are able to suckle sufficiently to prevent engorgement or by milking the animals in a manner that prevents um, the frequent engorgement. Not all producers realize the outcomes animals face when sold at auction markets and the repercussions of the animal is often compromised or unfit. So to give you an idea of what we mean by compromised, in respect of an animal, it means that an animal is bloated, um, but has no signs of discomfort or weakness, has acute frostbite, is blind in both eyes, has not fully healed after a procedure, including dehorning, detusking, or castration, is lame other than a way in which is described in the definition of unfit, has a deformity or a fully healed amputation and does not demonstrate signs of pain as a result of that deformity or amputation, is in a period of peak lactation, has an unhealed or acutely injured penis, has a minor, minor rector or major uh, vaginal prolapse, or sorry, has a minor rector or minor, minor vaginal prolapse has its mobility limited by a device applied to its body, including hobbles, other than hobbles applied to the aid in treatment, is a wet bird, or basically in the catch-all is exhibits any other signs of infirmity, illness, injury, or a condition that indicates that it has a, a reduced capacity to withstand transport. So any of these can be transported to a slaughter establishment or a place where it can receive care. These are not allowed to go to auction or any other type of assembly center. provisions for unfit animals. So an unfit animal can only be transported where, to a place where it can receive treatment or care. So a veterinary has recommended it. It is transported directly to this place and this place is not a slaughter establishment or an assembly center. For those animals deemed unfit, the provisions are much more strict. So when you're loading an unfit animal to go for veterinary care, it must be individually loaded and unloaded without having to negotiate ramps. It must have access to added bedding, provided more space. Um, a list of unfit animals. So anything that is non-ambulatory, has a fracture, is lame in one or more of its limbs, is lame to the extent that it cannot walk on all of its legs, is in shock or dying, has a prolapsed uterus or a severe rectal or vaginal prolapse, exhibit signs of a general nervous disorder, has labored breathing, has a severe open wound or severe laceration, has sustained an injury and is hobbled to aid in treatment, is extremely thin, dehydrated, hypothermic or hyperthermic, fevered, has a hernia that impedes its movement, including when a hind limb of the animal touches the hernia while the animal is walking. A hernia causes the animal to exhibit signs of pain or suffering. The hernia touches the ground when the animal is standing in its natural position, or it has an open, open wound or laceration. Unfit animals are also animals that are in the last 10% of their gestation period, or it has given birth in the preceding 48 hours. Has an unhealed or infected navel, a gangrenous udder, a severe squamous cell carcinoma of the eye, is bloated to the extent that it exhibits signs of discomfort or weakness, um, it exhibits signs of exhaustion, or, and again, the catch-all, exhibits any signs of infirmity, illness, injury, or of a condition that indicates that it cannot be transported without suffering.
Um, I don't expect you to read this slide. Um, these will be something that you're familiar with. However, I wanted to reiterate that it's very similar to other industry sectors. Uh, there are best practice animal assessments for fitness to travel information for your industries, such as the NAFEC has done here with these development guidelines decision trees. Um, these are always being updated to reflect the amended regulations. Uh, again, the codes of practice are very similar to what we're saying as well. Shipping a compromised animal to provincial abattoirs is appropriate and may be locally transported by special provisions to be humanely slaughtered. And again, that's compromised, that's not unfit. Um, again, this is a little bit out of the uh, presentation because the presentation was made for, for Alberta. I know they are starting to talk about mobile slaughter units on Ontario. I don't know if we have any available yet. Um, Tom, are you able to comment on that? Sorry, I was just responding to someone over chat. Um, oh, can you repeat <laughs> the question? <laughs> Uh, just, I was looking at this slide, and this comes from out in Alberta, where they're starting to see a lot more of the mobile slaughter units, but I haven't heard about any except for a couple poultry ones in Ontario yet, and I wasn't sure if, if you had heard of anything. Yeah, not any for um, small ruminants that I'm aware of, and certainly jump in, Anita, if you are, um, but, uh, but no, I'm not. Yeah, so hopefully they're coming, because they definitely do, uh, they do help for sure. So moving on to lactating animals, because we always get a lot of questions about what is peak lactation and what should I be looking for so that I'm not shipping my animal during peak lactation. Um, so basically, why is engorgement a concern? And so the basic thing to remember is that the outcome it's important to look at is to prevent mammary engorgement. So things that you're looking for before you ship your animal um, does the animal appear uncomfortable and reluctant to lie down? Are the mammary glands firm and hard and painful? Is the mammary tissue hot or warm to the touch? Um, is it pink or red? Uh, if the animal is exhibiting any of those conditions, then it shouldn't be shipped. Um, so an animal at peak lactation is listed as compromised, and this is due to the increased risk of mammary engorgement due to high production. Um, they further clarified that the animal is considered compromised and should be transported as such. If it is in lactation and it will not be milked to prevent mammary engorgement, please note that once it becomes engorged, the animal will be considered as compromised or unfit for transport, um, basically depending on the level of discomfort or suffering. So what you're looking at, basically dairy bred ewes or meat bred ewes whose lambs had died or was weaned early, as they may be culled while still in heavy lactation. A cull ewe that is lactating is very unlikely to receive the same attention as the lactating dairy cow, but it's still, its needs are still the same. So if it's not milked at intervals to prevent the mammary engorgement, the ewes become unfit due to the discomfort and pain caused by the swelling. So suffering becomes undue during transportation because of the vibrations in the road surface, the forced movement of the animal to navigate ramps, maintain balance, close contact with other animals. And these ewes, <clears throat> these ewes may be at risk of developing mastitis and becoming severely ill. So that's where all that is coming from. We now have a lovely infographic that just became available this week on the transporting of lactating animals. Um, so you guys are welcome to print this out and post it as well. And it goes through the steps of basically how to tell whether you should ship your, your you or not. So vulnerable animals when it comes to lambs and kids. So you've got two classes, lambs and kids, eight days of age and less, and then lambs and kids of nine days of age and older, but too young to be fed exclusively hay and grain. And a lot of this honestly comes basically from the dairy sector. Um, but it, since it applies to all ruminants, it does apply to sheep and goats too. So young unweaned kids lambs that are transported on long journeys are at a greater risk of experiencing disease, hypoglycemia, and cold conditions than adult animals. They lie down more than adults and are at benefit from the provision of bedding to facilitate lying down and reduce the risk of experiencing cold conditions. So lambs that are eight days of age or less, they can't be transported for more than 12 hours, and that's a single period not to be repeated even if they're with their dam, and they cannot be sent to assembly yards or auction centers. Lambs that are nine days of age and older, um, but are too young to be fed exclusively on hay and grain. In other words, those lambs that are still partially reliant on milk or milk replacer. 
They can also be transported for 12 hours, um, but with appropriate food, water, and rest, they may be transported again for 12 hours. And the intent is to assure that the young lambs have the rest, hydration, and nutrition that they need so that they are robust and ready for the second journey. So again, another lovely infographic um, that's available from our website. And while that speaks to calves, um, basically due to the number of unweaned calves that are transported in the veal sector, um, the information still applies to all ruminants and should be considered the same because the needs for the young animals are all the same as well. So ruminants too young to be fed exclusively on hay or grain um, that are eight days or less. So intended for fit, healthy animals, so those with a dry navel that are alert, up and walking, no scours, breathing well, ears up. So the maximum time is one transport of 12 hours. They must be monitored during that transport, and they must be transported to a specific place. So you can stop and pick up others, but they must only be loaded and unloaded once. There is no isolation required, but they should be segregated from animals that are older or um, not in the same category as them. Special measures should be taken to prevent unnecessary suffering. They should be loaded individually without negotiating a ramp. And the destination cannot be an assembly yard or an auction mark. So they must go direct to slaughter. And again, these are mostly focusing on the dairy provisions. So again, ruminants too young to be fed exclusively on hay and grain, basically those that are nine days and older. Again, you want to look at a dry, dry healed navel as an indicator of age. Um, again, we're looking at fit animals, so they have a maximum time in transport still of 12 hours, but with the option of a second journey after rest and recovery. These can be transported to an auction and assembly yard, but other than that, basically they're the same for loading and unload, unloading as the other ones are. Moving on to animal handling. So acceptable animal handling, and I know you guys all know this. Um, this is basically the third group of provisions. Uh, there's nothing new here. We're basically talking about good stockmanship. You know, um, no beating, kicking, whipping, or handling in a way to cause suffering, injury, or death. No use of prods. Um, no dragging, lifting by body parts. Um, again, you guys all know this. So animal handling and equipment for loading and unloading. So handling of animals is done in a manner that does not lead to harm. So equipment, ramp steps, gangways, design, use and maintenance, exterior ramp angles for sheep and goats is not to exceed 35 degrees. And again, that in the old regulations, it was 45. So that's one of the changes. So moving on to the protection of animals provision. Just as you producers would want to take steps to prevent animals from suffering because of the elements, um, there are other requirements listed here as well to be aware of, including the providing a floor that prevents the animals from tripping and slipping and falling, conveyance, conveyor, or crate is not likely to collapse or fall over, or no exposed bolt heads or angles or other projections or insecure fittings. Um, all of this is ultimately followed with the outcome um, looking at preventing injury, suffering, or death caused by transport. Uh, bedding is required. That's often a question we get asked. Definitely bedding is required and that's required to prevent pooling of urine and liquid waste and to provide traction and for the animal's comfort for cushioning and warmth. Uh, so by reviewing the elements of this provision, it is not okay to hog tie any animal and place it in the trunk or the backseat of a vehicle for transport. And we do get that question. I get that question quite often sometimes when I'm at the auction. So no, it is not okay to hog tie your animal and put it in the back of the pickup truck. The loading density of the belly and deck compartments on a transport should be given special considerations. Uh, the commercial transports out there know the old regulations that said you didn't need any bedding unless the trip was longer than 12 hours. Um, and again, we're now requiring bedding for all trips. And a lot of the drivers have been updated and we've done a lot of outreach. Space requirements. When you're looking at space requirements, in the case of livestock, 
Is the animal able to stand at all times within the conveyance or container with the feet on the floor, with the head elevated, with sufficient space to permit a full range of head movement without any part of its body coming into contact with the deck, roof, or top of the conveyance or cover of the container? So not like these sheep that have been squished in and you can see their heads touching the ceiling there. That's not good. Here we have a good example um, of where things go wrong, specifically a bad requirement. Clearly there are some issues with the load pictured above. Um, so some things to keep in mind, especially with sheep. Um, sheep with full fleece take up more room and require more floor space than sheep that have been shorn. Um, and with most species, loading density should be reduced in hot, humid weather and for long trips where the animals are more likely to rely down. So sheep and full fleece are very cold tolerant, but they don't tolerate wind and they will seek shelter from cold wind. They will also seek shade in hot weather and prefer to be out in the rain. Whereas recently shorn sheep are very prone to hypothermia if they don't not have adequate protection from wind chill and precipitation. And they're also prone to sunburn if they have no access to shade during part of that part of the day. Um, so these are all things to keep in mind um, when you're shipping your sheep and to look at the stresses of the transportation, uh, weather conditions and ventilation are super important to keep in mind. So sheep will lie down in the conveyance if they have sufficient space to do so. So keep in mind when that the loading densities for sheep are calculated based on standing room. The longer the trip is, the more likely your sheep are to lie down. Overloading and sometimes underloading trailer compartments can both compromise animal welfare and in circumstances increase the incidence of mortality. So keep in mind that loading density charts for sheep are calculated based on standing room. If animals are packed in, uh, if they go down, they can't get back up. So the picture here shown on the left is good. Everyone seems happy and has space to lie down and move. Um, however, on the right, we can see the animals are overcrowded. And you can also see there's a leg stuck there. That's really not very nice to see. So what is considered overcrowding? Because we often get that question too. So an animal is overcrowded if it cannot maintain its preferred body position or adjust its body position in order to protect itself from injuries or avoid being crushed or trampled. So the animal is likely to develop a pathological condition such as hyperthermia, hypothermia, frostbite, or the animal is likely to suffer or sustain an injury or die. Uh, the loading densities in the affect goats can be used as guides. That's not a problem. Uh, animals should also be segregated by incompatibility. So animals that are incompatible, um, if it, are considered incompatible if any of the animals are likely to suffer, sustain an injury or die if they are unloaded, confined, transported or loaded together. So basically you're looking at your rams that may fight um, if they've shown a particular aggressive pattern previously or animals from a bunch of different farms that get mixed together um, or dams with young that are mixed with other animals. So two new requirements within the amended regulations are captured in the record keeping section, and that's the section we'll look at next. And we always get a lot of questions about these ones. So required humane transport documentation, there's two types. So these two documents essentially capture what's on your load and the evidence that it was cared for. So the intent is to ensure information about the animal's journey is available and can be shared when needed with anyone that's involved in the humane transport. So the transfer of care is to ensure that there is no gap in responsibility when animals arrive at the assembly center or slaughter establishments. When sheep or lambs are left at a slaughter facility or assembly center, the transporter must provide a written notice that the animals have arrived, along with a document specifying certain information about the load of animals to the receiver. This is done to ensure the continuity of the care for the animals, and so the individual responsible for caring for the animals is always clearly identified. The format of this documentation is not specified in the regulations and may be paper or electronic. The animal transport record will have some overlap with the provincial livestock manifests. Some provinces are integrating the two documents into their livestock manifests, while some are opting to create their own. We'll get into a bit more depth on the next couple of slides. So an animal transport record, the regulation prescribes the information to be contained in the records. The elements of the provision are listed here on this slide. 
Some of this information is already collected for provincial livestock manifests. So these records must be kept for two years. So you're looking at the name and address of the producer or shipper, the receiver, the transport company, and the driver's name, license, registration number, the conveyance information, how much space is available to the animals, when was it last cleaned and disinfected, date, time, place where the animals were loaded, the number, description, and weight of the animals, and the date, time when the animals last had food, water, and rest. Transfer of care. So when animals are left at any slaughter facility or assembly center. So the slaughter establishment responsibility, as well as how much responsibilities the plant have when the load arrives there. So the transfer of care involves parties to ensure that there is no gap in responsibility upon, revival, upon arrival at assembly centers or slaughter establishments. So the date, time, and place when the animals last had food, water, and rest, the condition of the animals on arrival, and the date and time of arrival of the animal at the slaughter or assembly center. What do you do if no one will sign the TOC? It is the transporter's responsibility to make the receiver aware when their role stops and the receiver's role starts for the responsibility for the care of the animals. Transporters can't make receivers acknowledge the responsibility, but you can make a record of the interaction to protect yourselves. If transporters don't have any proof that they handed over responsibility for the animals on their load, they could be held responsible if something goes, long, goes wrong later. Our transfer of care is required at food, water, rest stops. Answer is no. <clears throat> okay, hopefully everyone's doing good. We're on the final stretch. <laughs> We're just gonna cover the final food, water and rest. So both food, water and rest is outcome-based provisions. So the animal must not become dehydrated, exhausted or suffer from nutritional deficiencies and prescriptive intervals. For instance, there's a maximum of hours that animals can go without food, water and rest. Safe water as defined in the regs is potable water or water does not pose a, or water that does not pose a risk to the health of the animal. So sheep and goats generally fall into the 36 hour category, provided that they can be fed exclusively on hay and grain and are fit for the entire end transport. All animals must receive at least eight hours of consecutive rest prior to any leg of transport. Animals can be rested on board a conveyance provided it is stopped um, and it must also meet the elements of the provision. So this just kind of gives you an idea, basically in chart format, what the maximums are right now. Basically, these are the prescriptive times. Um, but for instance, if you have an animal <clears throat> that becomes compromised or becomes unfit, um, then that takes precedence over these timings. It's important to comment on the difference between confinement time, which was the focus of the previous regulations, and the period or the interval without access to food, water, and rest. So the clock used to start when the transport started, but now it starts when the animals last had access to food, water, and rest. Um, so as soon as one element is not available to the animals, the time interval starts. So basically, like if you're taking an animal off feed prior to shipping it to slaughter, that's when your transport time starts, not when the animal actually climbs onto the transport. So I touched the base on this at the beginning of the presentation and we'll reiterate here in case there's still some questions. Um, so we're currently coming to the end of our two year period. Um, it will end on the 20th of February, 2022. Um, and so the new food, water and rest intervals become completely enforceable at that time. So again, to reiterate, food, water, rest intervals start when the animal last had access to these elements. Uh, so quickly touch on the regulations specific for plain C or the new fangled fully equipped vehicles. Um, so animals transported by air must meet the International Trans Air Transport Associations or IATA and the live animal regulations. 
Um, there's a few HAR provisions that have been incorporated by reference for overcrowding and basically conveyor and contain, uh, conveyances and containers regulations um, for them. Animals transported by sea, there are very specific requirements for sea transport um, that are, can be all found within the HAR. Um, so these documents must be sent to the vet at the point of embarkation as soon as or as soon as possible after the arrival at the destination if they're coming into Canada. Again, if there's any questions particular to transport by air or by sea, um, you guys can send them to me at the end of the presentation and, and I can uh, send you specific information on it. Accountability. So the producer's role in transport decisions is absolutely critical. So especially in the selection of the right animals to ship uh, and in your communication with your transporters. So communication is so important. And it's important to make the right decisions early at the farm level. Why often these decisions are based on economics, welfare matters. Up until now, there was very little economic disincentive for shipping compromised animals to auction. Um, it was more of an ethical decision. And now it's the law. These animals cannot be shipped to auction. So do not defer your problem or the responsibility further down the value chain. So in earlier uh, culling decisions and other considerations as part of your production and management plans. Someone is always watching and learning, particularly if you have little ones at home. So be sure to keep animal welfare top of the mind when making decisions for these transport. So what does this all mean for you? So everyone in the transport continuum has an impact on improving the welfare of animals in their care. Predict, plan, prevent. Less talk, more auction. There's a saying we hear often that everyone wants progress, but no one likes change. I would really like to pat you producers on the back and say that you do an excellent animal care on the farm and perhaps in the past have sometimes turned a blind eye to the animal's journey once it leaves the farm. So now we're asking for the same care and transport as you do on the farm. And you guys do a great job of looking after your animals on the farm. And I know we can do a great job of looking after them while they're being transported as well. So the enforcement outcome will depend on what the party did or did not do to protect the animal's welfare. So if you've done absolutely everything in your power to make sure that the animals have been transported safely and appropriately and, and bad things happen that are beyond your control, we take that into account. Ignoring, denying, justifying, or laying blame, shrugging shoulders, can't happen anymore, especially in the selection of the right animals to ship and especially in communication with the transporters. So just as a summary, some of the key changes to the part 12 in the HAR. So knowledge and skills are required to transport animals. Commercial carriers must train their staff Assessment of the animals must be done prior to transport. There must be monitoring en route. You must have contingency plans. The transport documentation, the transfer of care and records for transporters, compromised and unfit conditions for transport are now defined in the law. It's not just a policy anymore. Maximum time intervals for without feed, uh, access to feed, safe water and rest have changed for some species. And there are now special provisions for handling specific classes of vulnerable animals. Control and enforcement options. So moving into the enforcement side um, where my operation colleagues can provide more insight. However, I'll touch base on some of the key information that you guys need to be aware of. So in cases of non-compliance, um, inspectors consider harm to the animal, the history of the regulated party and the intent. There are various enforcement tools used which are listed here and are dependent on the severity of the non-compliance of the situation. So basically when things go wrong, um, we can seize and detain, uh, we can require that an animal be sent to another location in order to proceed for a humane transport inspection. We can order unfit or compromised animals to be humanely killed. We can order them removed from Canada. There are letters of non-compliance, uh, notice of violation with warning, notice of violation with penalty and prosecution. All of those are part of our enforcement options. So AMPS or administrative monetary penalty, 
limitations. So no proceedings in respect of a violation may commence later than six months after the day the violation occurred in the case of a minor violation or two years after the day of the violation in the case of a serious or very serious. So when it comes to violations and prosecutions in instances of higher severity, the Agriculture and Agri-Food Administration Monetary Penalties Act and its regulations, AMPS, cases must be written up within certain time frames. Where can you find out more information? So here's a screenshot of the CFIA Humane Transport and Animal Welfare page that I've mentioned during this webinar. Um, there's tons of information here and I encourage you to click through and familiarize yourself with the resources that are available. So Livestock Canada, Livestock Transport in Canada brochure, there's another printable PDF to provide a quick overview of the things you need to be aware of when making decisions about transporting animals.